Tonight we're going to uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, can you all see that? I hope you can. Um, we're going to be talking about American genre painting. Um, American genre painting means literally uh, paintings uh, about people. Um, uh, and we're going to. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you uh, how the uh, how American genre painting began, uh, where its roots are. Uh, in the in, both in England and in America, and then I'm going to show you some examples uh, from that. So we're, we're going to begin uh, tonight. This is a this is a picture of of uh, of Captain Thomas Smith. Uh, this is self portrait of Captain Thomas Smith, painted uh, in uh, Massachusetts in 1680, and it has the distinction. Uh, it has two distinctions of being the only 17th century um, New England painting that is clearly linked to a known painter and the earliest extant American self-portrait. So, and that may not sound like a big deal, but it's a very big deal, considering that the country was, uh, ha had only been around for a century or so. Um, the thing that I want to point out, and now I'm going to see whether this works. Can you, can you all see the little red dot? Great. So. Um, Captain Smith is holding a, a, his hand on a skull and a document, and actually the document is signed. That's how we know that th what this picture is. Um, and then in the background here is a very uh, uh, fiery uh, naval engagement that you could see over his shoulder. And these two things, th so the three uh, essential elements or the really important elements of the picture are clearly his face, uh, because it's a portrait after all, a self-portrait. And then these two things here are called attributes. And so we know from this picture that he had something to do with, with the Navy. And we also know that he had something to do with this document. I don't really know what the, um, what the meaning of the, of the skull is. Uh, we're going to move uh, along here now to the next uh, picture, which I think I have. Yes, here we go. Uh, this is a picture by Ralph Earle, painted in Connecticut, of Elijah Boardman. This is, picture was painted in 1789. The picture hangs in the Metropolitan Museum. And um, uh, this is a very typical picture by R Ralph Earle. It's a, it's a life-size picture. Uh, it probably stands seven feet high or something like that. But once again, we have here the likeness of Elijah Boardman. But we also have these very interesting uh, attributes here. Uh, this, these appear to be bolts of cloth in the background, and these here are obviously account books. There's one more interesting attribute in the picture that we mustn't fail to see, and that is that he's very well dressed. And so uh, Ralph Earle is telling us, or Elijah Boardman, who hired Ralph Earle, is telling us that he is a, a, a wealthy man and that he made his money probably in, in cloth, but that he, he handles his affairs uh, in, a, in an orderly fashion. So he is an upstanding, uh, important member of Connecticut society. In our next portrait, this is a portrait by Charles Wilson Peel of Philadelphia, and it's called The Artist in His Museum, painted in 1822. And for those of you with some uh, knowledge of Philadelphia, you would know that the Pennsylvania Academy, where this picture hangs, is the oldest museum in the country. And the museum was actually started by Charles Wilson Peel. So wh what is interesting here, once again, now you all know where to look. So here, obviously, is Charles Wilson Peel, because this is a self-portrait. And so we have a likeness of, of Charles Wilson Peel. And then we have these attributes. This is a turkey, a turkey buzzard which was um, obviously an interesting uh, specimen in those days, and he has one here in the museum. This is not a live turkey. This is, uh, this is a stuffed thing. And then, and then over here is some other uh, curious uh, object. I'm not altogether sure what that is. But here, if you look back here, you see a bird in this cage here. So this, and these are all uh, stuffed taxidermy. Uh, things that, that Mr. Peel has brought from all over the world, and here are the visitors. And Mr. Peel is doing something interesting. He's pulling back the curtain on his museum. He's, he's inviting us in, and he's sort of uh, giving us this grand gesture. The picture is about as big as it appears here. It's like 12 feet high, and so Mr. Peel is also uh, grandiloquent. He is proud of himself, and he is proud of his museum, and who knows if it went back as far, this looks like it's as long as a football field, but um, 
uh, Mr. Peel was a successful uh, Renaissance man. So he was well educated, he was a painter, and he collected all these wonderful things from all over the world. Um, in our next portrait here, we have a, a, we have a picture of, uh, by John Nagel, which is called Pat Lyon at the Forge. This is also in the Pennsylvania Academy. And you know by now what I'm going to tell you. Uh, Pat is, is uh, it, it, there's Pat right there. And here are the attributes of his trade, the, the leather apron, the hammer, the, the tongs, and the, and, the, and the fire itself back here. Here is his assistant. And in case you had any doubt, here's Independence Hall back here. So uh, Mr. Lyon was obviously a, an important blacksmith in the town. He was also a member of the town council, so he was not simply a blacksmith. And, and he's, uh, this picture is also huge, probably about the same size as you see it here, 12 feet high or so. And so, uh, so what we're getting at here, what we're sort of, uh, what I'm trying to describe to you is that these are not simply portraits, that you must look all over the picture and you'll see these other things. These are what is, uh, these are what is important to us in our, in our talk right now. Now this is a picture by John Singleton Copley. It's a portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Mifflin. It hangs in the, in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And uh, Mrs. Mifflin here is spinning, uh, she, which is a curiosity because we see that, that she is also extremely well dressed. And, and she is sitting at, a, at what looks like a spinet. And Mr. Mifflin has got a paper in his hand. And so he is a man of letters, also well dressed. And in the background here, you see a, a classical column. So all of these things are, are very important so, uh, to, to the Mifflins who hired John Singleton Copley, who was the premier painter uh, of New York and Philadelphia and Boston. Um, and he painted all of the rich and famous. So uh, all of these things are messages here that the, that the Mifflins are rich, that they are well dressed, that they can afford this, this thing called a spinet. But, by the way, Mrs. Mifflin is still spinning. And, and, that, and that's an indication to you that she is also a housekeeper, uh, that she probably uh, is proud of the fact that she runs her household. That, that would be, I, I, we don't think that this is simply, that she was just pulling this thread at the moment that, uh, that uh, Copley uh, uh, came by. Now, we're going to change uh, gears just a little bit here. This is by Arthur Devis. Uh, Arthur Devis was an 18th century p uh, painter in, in London. <clears throat> and this is uh, Robert Gwilliam and family, painted in 1749. And so this is what is happening on the other side of the, of the, of the pond. And it's important for us to realize that in the, seventh, in the uh, 18th century here in the United States, uh, we looked, or our painters did, uh, to uh, England for our for uh, for their inspiration, and what was what was um, uh, au courant in London would be would they would try to bring it here. Naturally, it might there might be a lag of six months, maybe a year, maybe even two years until the painters kind of caught on with the things that were happening. So this is a, this is the first. Now we're getting a little bit away from a portrait. You will remember that in the pictures that we were looking at before certainly with this one here, there's no doubt in your mind this is a portrait because the, the sitters are right up against the picture plane. Here, in this portrait, the sitters are not right up against the picture plane. They're set back into a landscape. And clearly, this is their seat, this rather uh, magnificent house back here. And, and the, 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 uh, the patriarch is here. This would undoubtedly be his son. And this is, this is his wife and children. This is his wife and their children and so on and so forth. So what we have here is what is called a conversation piece. And this painting is probably only about this big. And so it, I don't want to necessarily invoke the specter of the, of the snapshot here, but, but we're moving in that direction. We're getting away from the 12 foot high portrait and we're getting down into something that was kind of a little more manageable. And the intention here of the painter and by extension of the sitters who paid the painter is that, oh, we were just out on this walk. And lo and behold, Arthur Devis is here. And so we would stop momentarily and perhaps strike a pose while Mr. Devis did, did his work. We all know that it didn't happen that way because 
Clearly, Mr. Devis would have to take each likeness in turn. Who knows how many years he spent, uh, maybe a whole year, painting all of these likenesses with the children and the dog. Let's not, let's not leave out. We have even the little dog here. And so it's a confection. But the impression that I'm, that, we are trying to, that I'm trying to tell you about is that this picture is sort of like a snapshot. Uh, here is another one of the same ilk. This one is by Thomas Gainsborough. It's a portrait of the artist with his wife and daughter. So here we have Thomas Gainsborough himself, a very young man, and his wife and little daughter. And I think this is their dog. And naturally, the dog is just having a drink here, not concerned about the fact that we're posing for a picture. And this is really a very interesting conceit because, of course, Gainsborough is painting the picture. He's put himself in the picture, and he's painting the picture as well. So once again, we're in a landscape. We're very beautifully dressed. And perhaps this is the way Thomas Gainsborough and his wife went out for a walk of the afternoon. <laughs> perhaps not. But clearly, he did not discover himself in the woods uh, with his wife and dog and child. And so we're getting even closer to this notion of the snapshot. Um, the next picture here, if I could bring it up. This, now we're back to the United States. This is by Matthew Pratt. Not a very well-known uh, picture. It's called The American School. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And, and here we have several uh, of the, of the uh, well-known uh, painters of the day uh, who were contemporaries of Matthew Pratt. And in those days, it was important if you were an American painter, the, you would get going a little bit at home. And if you had some talent, maybe the people of the village or people who you knew, your family, friends, and so forth, would come up with the money to send you to, to Europe. And you, your first stop would be to go to London, and you would enroll in a school there. You might spend some time. If you were really good, fortunate, you would go to Paris. If you were really, really fortunate, you would take a, 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 a coach and go down to, to, uh, to Rome, and you would see the wonders of, of the world and so forth and so on. So this is, this is really a casual picture. These are portraits. Uh, uh, Benjamin West is in here, uh, and I forget who else, I'm sorry, it's not important, John Trumbull perhaps. These are very young men, as you can, men, as you can see. They are not posing. They, they, are, they are caught in a, in a moment of time. We know that in, in uh, 1765, once again, you can't capture uh, a, a picture just like that, as, you, as you, you were all accustomed to doing now, just on your cell phone. The picture had to be painted. But notice that none of them are looking out at us. None of them are posing, per se. They are posing for Matthew Pratt. But here they are doing what they would be doing. And so now we have, we are, we are getting to the roots of American genre painting. So here we have a picture by John Greenwood. This is called Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname, 1752. Um, the picture is at the St. Louis Art Museum. So th this picture uh, stands out for a number of reasons. Number one, nobody is posing in this picture. Uh, and we have here a raucous tavern scene. These are, as the title tells us, sea captains carousing in Suriname. There are also, obviously, other people in here who are not sea captains. This, this figure lying on the ground is clearly not a sea captain. I think this man here appears to be vomiting in his cup or his sleeve or something. I, I'm not altogether sure. Uh, there are dogs. There are overturned chairs. This is not a this is not a posed picture by any imagination, stretch of the imagination. But it's it's a very early genre painting, and it's it's helpful to us today because once again, this is a picture of people doing what they're doing. None of these are portraits. We can pretty much be assured that nobody that John Greenwood knew would have wanted to be represented in this scene but with a likeness of his own visage. So this is a, a, a total con confection. Uh, here we are back to Co uh, Copley again. This is Sir William Pepperell and his family uh, at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And it's, it's one more uh, of a, this is obviously a casual, I mean, this is, couldn't be more casual. Mummy is dressed very, very well. The daughters here are dressed very well, but they're playing with something here that appear to have some game figures here. I can't tell if those are chess figures or what. 
this this little girl is kind of certainly not sort of doing what she should be doing. The dog is. I mean, the dog is at least facing out. Uh, Sir William Pepperell is, has got his best clothing on, and he's attending this. It's a pretty laid-back organization, and yet here we have again this imposing column. This is a reference to ancient Greece or Rome, and in America to make references to ancient Greece or Rome was a bit of a conceit. Um, but here we have the curtain being pulled back again, and so we're, this is a, a genre for, or this is a, a, a convention for, once again, revealing. And so Copley and, and, and uh, Sir William Pepperell are revealing themselves. And they're, they're not, you remember the picture of the Mifflins who were seated rather, rather stiffly before, while they had their pictures done. Nothing stiff here. This is very, very laid back. This thing here on the bottom, by the way, this is sort of fun. This is a turkey carpet. And, and we don't want to fail to see that because in America, if you had a turkey carpet, I mean, this was the height of elegance. Now we're going to jump, I'm sorry that this slide is a little fuzzy, but we're going to, we're going to jump into a, 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 another a genre of genre. When I use the term genre, genre means a, also means a class of pictures. So portraiture is a genre, um, uh, folk art is a genre, portraiture is a, is a genre, and, uh, and then of course genre is a genre. So um, right now we're going to get into, into military pictures, also referred to as history paintings. History paintings have a tendency to be very large, uh, sometimes maybe 20, 25 feet across. And uh, this one is not that big. Uh, this is the death of Wolfe uh, um, on the Plains of Abraham. This is, a, this is a picture from 1770. And it's a scene from the, from the revolution, of course. And this, uh, this uh, picture, this is, this is General Wolfe here, dying in this extremely elegant pose. Um, and this, this is an American Indian, probably an Iroquois, Iroquois or, or uh, uh, one of the Eastern tribes. And uh, these would be his aide de camps. And so on here is the, the flag and so forth. And what, what we are memorializing here, by the way, these are, these would be portraits, these would be likenesses, all of these portraits here, all of these men w would have been present and, and they would be all recognizable. But I'm sure some of you, at least some of you, must be thinking of the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima uh, by, I'm afraid I can't remember who. But, but, the, but the intent is the same, that, that this was an, a, 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 uh, a turning point in the war, a very significant moment in the war. Do we think that it actually looked like this? Most certainly not. Is this the way we, are, in, we uh, are being asked to remember it? Most certainly yes. So, uh, and, and by the way, uh, in, in the 18th century, military genre pictures or history pictures were always glorious. We, we're not into the gory aspects of war. That happened another hundred years later. Uh, here is another of a similar scene. This is by John Trumbull, the sortie made by the garrison of Gibraltar in 1789. Once again, we have uh, real portraits. I'm not going to tell you who these people are because I don't know. It isn't, it isn't important. What is important is that the battle is actually raging here, you see. And the, these, the, these men are actually dressed this way for war. Uh, this is obviously a general here and his uh, aide-de-camp. And these are soldiers up here on the ramparts. And so on. this picture is also uh, sort of 20 feet long by maybe 10, 15 feet high. And it, it too is not really a portrait. There are portraits in it, but it is a genre painting. Uh, we're back to John Sinclair Copley. This is Watson and the Shark at the National uh, Gallery in Washington, D.C. There's another version of it in the Detroit Art Institute uh, in Detroit. Um, uh, this picture, uh, uh, John Watson was a, was a famous uh, man who went swimming, and this is what happened to him. He got his leg uh, cut off by a shark, and these uh, men uh, were uh, witnesses to the scene. And uh, this man here is obviously going to dispatch the shark, and these people here are going to save him. What is, what is really important here <clears throat> is the construction of the picture. We have a sort of a pyramidal kind of shape here. 
And this, this kind of, see, this, sort of uh, this sort of format for a history picture is very important because it sort of elevates the, 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 the heightened sense we get. A, if, if everybody were seated like at a table or scattered as they are in the, in the, Surin, the captains in Suriname, it, it's a kind of a hodgepodge. This, the implication here is that somehow this is arranged. And yet, we don't want to think of it as an arranged scene. As we look at it, we, want to, we sort of want to see that, that these things are happening simultaneously. The shark is attacking. This man is attacking the shark. These people are pulling him out. These things could not have possibly happened at the same moment. And certainly, the painter wouldn't have been there um, to capture it, even if it did. So we have, again, all of the elements of a genre painting um, in a snapshot, as it were, um, but but uh, more or less uh, uh, giving us an idea of what the scene of, of what the painter and the people who are in it wanted us to remember about it. This is by John, uh, George Caleb Bingham. It's called the County Election, 1852. It's in the St. Louis Art Museum, and the the scene here, as the title implies, is a county election, and here is obviously. Uh, a candidate, I don't know, he doesn't, I don't, let's assume he's not taking money or giving money, he's probably accepting a ballot up here. And then other people here, these, this little group here are talking and, and uh, this man here is making some sort of point, these two men are probably listening. He, this man is obviously passed out, he's been given, uh, I don't know, he may be a soldier, maybe a veteran because he has a bandage on his head, or he could be a vagrant, not entirely sure. Here's your obligatory dog. Here are the uh, children here down here playing mummy peg. Uh, this man here seems to be very amply fed and he's holding forth to somebody or other. And this looks like a man carrying another. Can't exactly see what this is. Um, th th this is, a, this is we, we've now crossed completely away from, from, uh, from portraiture altogether. There are no, my guess is, there are no likenesses in this picture. These are types. George Caleb Bingham is telling us, if you had been present at the election that we just had last year, these are the people that you would see there. Uh, and these are, the, these are the types of people. This one, I love this little figure down here in the top hat. And he's obviously writing something out. This man is either just looking on or else he's dictating, as is this one here. And this man here uh, uh, topping his hat. Here we, have this, here we have this pyramidal structure again. Uh, the apex of it by this uh, this uh, sign here, maybe a banner of some kind. And uh, uh, Bingham uh, also was a very good landscape painter, so he's giving us this here. But this is not an attribute back here. This is background. And uh, you, you remember when we were talking about Pat Lyons at the Forge or Charles Wilson Peale, the things in the background were attributes of the sitter. This is simply uh, this is simply background. It has really nothing to do with the with the county election per se. Here's another absolutely beautiful picture by George Caleb Bingham. This is called the Jolly Flatboatman of 1846. He painted a number of scenes like this. Uh, they must have been popular for him, or else he liked them. Uh, maybe both. Here we have again this perennial structure. Um, we do not have a glorious, uh, we're, we're not commemorating a battle here. This is not something that we are supposed to think was an historical moment uh, because these are simply types. We, uh, we can be pretty well assured that none of these, they could be friends of the artist, but he's not memorializing them by name um, and their names are lost to history. But Bingham is borrowing this, this con construction to give his, his picture uh, a, a little bit of, of stature that, once again, it wouldn't have if these men were just lying all over the place and, and were uh, not uh, organized like this. They, by the way, are taking a freight. Uh, who knows what the freight is? Maybe these are rolled up hides, or it could be wood. I'm not sure. But they, they load the raft, and then they just float down the, the Missouri River uh, to market. That's what, the, that's what the action is. This picture here is by John Ferguson Weir called Forging the Shaft, 1874. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. These 
these men uh, are, this is what they are doing. They're, th this huge, big, this machine, this roller here with this thing that looks like a bicycle chain, which is just what it is. Somebody, you see there's a line going down here, there's a cable, and this man is working this wheel, which turns this huge shaft, and they're pulling it out of the fire. I mean, this is pretty dramatic. Uh, and uh, the, 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 um, all of the structure, these huge wooden timbers up here like this, and, the, and of course the brilliance of the fire and so forth it just must have been unbearable in there. But again, this is certainly not a portrait, but it is very much a genre painter. It's telling us for the ages what, these, what, what it was like in the, in, the, uh, in the place where they made these huge shafts. Who knows, this is probably a propeller shaft or something, maybe it's too big for that. Who knows uh, what that is? But uh, clearly, this is a, a, a manufacturing, a big, important uh, manufacturing. Uh, now, this we're going to go back to London, and this picture is by. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Don't go away. Uh, um, okay, here we go. It's by Albert Kipe, and Albert Kipe. Th this picture is called uh, the Negro Slave. And uh, what is interesting is, is that we have all this beautiful background here. We have these two absolutely beautiful horses, a beautiful, beautiful dog. We have this man here is probably uh, the, uh, the owner. He could be a dealer in these horses. We're not altogether sure. But this is the subject of the picture, the Negro uh, uh, page. And the only reason I drop it in here is because we're going to, we're going to now move to a, a, another genre of genre pictures, which is the inclusion of the black man um, in, uh, in American genre pictures. It began pretty early in America. This one here is by William Sidney Mount, and this picture is called um, Schoolboys Quarreling. And so obviously the, these are the schoolboys, we can tell that, and they are obviously have an issue. And uh, we're not in any doubt about that. This one back here is engaged in the quarrel, but he almost looks like he's, he's not very threatened. He's not worried. So he's kind of saying, yeah, you tell him. And th these boy, this boy here is just kind of watching. This boy here is maybe rolling up his sleeve. He's thinking about maybe he's going to have to get involved. But this little black boy here is, is uh, observing the action, as is the woman in the background here. But the inclusion of the black boy in 1830 in American genre paintings began uh, a, 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 um, a, a rather significant trend in American genre pictures leading up to the Civil War, leading up to Appomattox. And, it, and you, you, will, you will know, we're going we're gonna to look at a few more here. The, the, the presence of the black man or the black boy in this case is not simply, he's not simply there. He's usually playing a part. And I don't know exactly what part he's playing. He is carrying a basket. Not entirely sure what that means. Um, in this picture here by John uh, Lewis Crimmel, it's called The Quilting Frolic. And clearly, uh, we, have, or we have a few generations of people. We're in a middle class household, maybe even an upper middle class household. Uh, this is the patriarch. Uh, this is possibly, uh, possibly a servant, I'm not altogether sure. These people have just come in the door. Obviously, they're arriving at, at this. Uh, at w this lady is, is putting up a, a quilt onto a frame. Here comes a minstrel uh, uh, who's going to play, and we're going to have a party. And we have here some, uh, some uh, service. This looks like tea. Not, not alcohol, the table has been set. Uh, here's another little black child here. Uh, somebody else coming through the door. What is interesting to me, I love to look at, are the, all these little elements of still life all around the picture, up here. Each one of these little things can be kind of thought of in its own right, this little chair. Each one of these things, the painter had to make a decision, his little cat down here. The, 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 the painter is more or less not entirely filling the space. That's, he is filling the space, but he's having fun. He's just putting in all these little elements because he can. He's not probably painting this for somebody. I doubt if it's a portrait. He's painting it to put, to put on exhibit in a, in a gallery someplace or in a, in a, in a public uh, exhibition, and he will put it out for sale. 
but it is a genre painting because again, it shows Americans doing what uh, Americans are doing. Uh, here is a, a picture, rare picture in a, in a this is uh, by, um, we don't know who this is by, it's American School, we refer to it, uh, probably about 1830, same as the William Sidney Mount. I think it actually has uh, some, it looks a little bit like uh, William Sidney Mount. It's rare because it's a snow time picture. I mean, artists don't ordinarily go outside uh, to paint when it's snowing. Uh, and if they, if they do paint a snow scene, undoubtedly they're painting it indoors. What is interesting about it is the presence of the black man in the back. He's not part of the action, but look where he is. He's right on the center line in the picture. And over on this group over here, we have six boys over here, and we have six boys over here. And so does this not remind us of the six uh, states uh, that were in the Union in 1830, or the... Uh, uh, 12 rather, just before or just after perhaps uh, um, uh, the Missouri Compromise. And so w what we have here is we have a fight going on about slavery because the, the, the presence of the black man can't be, he's not, he, he didn't just happen to be there when the painter painted this picture. He is put in there not just uh, as, a, as, a, as a post, he is playing a, an extremely important part because he's in the center of the picture. And we're going to see more of that in a minute. This picture is by Charles Days, D-E-A-S, and this picture is called Walking the Chalk. I discovered that, well, actually, this, the lady who owned this picture discovered me because she had this picture, and it was only a little picture like this, and she knew who it was by because it's clearly signed and dated on the front and on the back. And she and her husband, who was a stonecutter in northern Nova Scotia, 28 hours drive from here, uh, up there, she looked me up on the internet, or she looked up Charles Days on the internet. And I had done some, writ I had written some things about Charles Days, and she stumbled across my name, and she called me, and I quickly drove up there. She didn't have really any idea what the picture was, other than that she had identif uh, identified it correctly. So. Um, here's what's going on here. Once again, we have a little black man right in the middle of the picture. Ostensibly, what the subject of the picture is, this man here is, is walking a chalk in the same way that the policeman will ask you to, to, to walk a line when he pulls you over and he suspects that you are drunk. So these people have challenged this man. He's in a tavern, and he's had a couple of drinks, and he is showing us that he can <clears throat> maneuver the line. What is more important, really, is the black man is right on this line. Again, he's the center of the action. And we have a group of people over here, not six in this case. We have a little group of people over here on this side. And this man is walking the line. The black man is the line of the picture. Now, curiously, and in the picture itself, this big uh, area here, this curtain, is pretty much red. The, the slide's not so good. Um, but it, it's this big uh, red presence, if you will. Over here, we have a big blue presence over here. I mean, he didn't need to paint that thing blue. And now, bear with me a minute. If you look at this cage and you turn that figure upside, not the figure, take the figure out. Turn this thing right here on its side. It's an American flag. You see here are the stripes. And here is the field where the stars would be. And so Days, by the way, was 19 when he painted this picture in 1837. And he's making a political statement. And he would be making more of a political statement. In other words, he would be being a little bit more brash if he dared. But the subject of, of, of slavery was a hot topic. And most people really either didn't want to discuss it, or if they did discuss it, they only maybe discussed it with their friends. Days, who clearly did not, this is no portrait. And he did not have this picture sold. He is not painting it for a patron. He's putting this black man in here, and he puts him again at the background so that his white audience, and his audience would be white, all white, they're not going to see him so much. And if they do, he's only in the background. The political aspects of the picture would escape them completely. This picture here is by Richard Catton Woodville. By the way, uh, uh, we're deep into genre picture uh, painting right now, and I'm showing you uh, George Caleb Bingham, William Sidney Mount, Charles Days, Richard Catton Woodville are the top names. These are the, these are the very, very best 
painters of the, of the style. And uh, Charles Days and Richard Kenton Woodville, only about 20, 25 pictures by them known. So these pictures are exceedingly rare. Well, they're so rare they don't, they don't pop up, which is why I drove 28 hours to Nova Scotia to get that one by Charles Days. Um, it was venal. I, I, I can't help it. So this picture is called um, War News from Mexico, 1848. And what is happening here, this man is coming out of the, of the hotel, the American hotel, and he sees in the paper that the United States has just beaten Mexico, has just conquered Mexico, as it were, uh, and uh, most Americans were probably not even aware that this was, going, it was taking place. We just sent uh, 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 a small contingent of soldiers down to Mexico because they owed us a lot of money. They owed us four or five million dollars. And so we just went down there and kicked their butt and, and we very uh, uh, graciously forgave them the debt if they would give us what is now a third of the country. So they gave us Texas, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, uh, uh, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, did I leave one out? They gave us a third of the country and we agreed not to shoot them against the wall. Uh, what is going on here? It, it, this this man reading the paper, and all these other people are are expressing. I mean, can you believe it? I mean, they're, they're sort of a. It, this is a, obviously a news moment. This man's putting out a cigarette or a lit match over here into a rain barrel. He's kind of flicking it out like that. I don't know if that implies that the uh, uh, sort of in, in the same way you would snuff something out. Maybe he's maybe he's saying to us that this is over. Not, not entirely sure. That's a curious gesture. Here is a black man and, and a little girl. They are not in the center of the action, but they are clearly part of the scene. And so Richard Cotton Woodville is obviously making a point about, about uh, 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 black people. And, and by the way, this is still well before the Civil War. The main thing here in the picture, and it always helps if you look, if you draw a kind of a cross, like an X, right across a picture like this, and you go right to the middle of it, which is here, whatever you see there is ordinarily important to the painter. And what this is, this, is a, this thing here is, a, is an issue of the Picayune, which was published in, in, um, in uh, New Orleans at that time. And the Picayune was a very important paper. And the Picayune had, they knew that this war was going on down in Mexico, and so they sent a reporter down and when the, the, the Treaty of, of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, uh, giving uh, uh, the United States all this land, the, the, the reporter jumped on his horse or whatever he had to do, and he hurried back to, to New Orleans to give the story. Now, you can only imagine that probably took, I don't know what, three weeks, four or five weeks, who knows. But the Picayune ran the story. It was the first newspaper in the country to run the story. And the other thing about the, about the newspaper, which is interesting, is that the, the, the newspapers before this picture was painted used to be printed one page at a time, like this. Boom, bloop, boom, bloop. They'd pick up the paper, and then they would print it, and then they would deliver it over here. The Picayune had just introduced a rolling drum, which could pick up the paper, and uh, on one half roll and print it on the, on the next half roll and pick it up and, and print it and pick it up and print it and throw it off like that. And it increased the productivity of the press by a factor of maybe a hundred. And this would be the equivalent of the, of the, of the computer coming in replacing the typewriter. It, it was that important. So the fact that the paper is in the middle of the, of the painting would not have escaped. We all would look at it and we'd be tempted to think, well, the guy's reading the paper. Um, uh, and why isn't he reading it online? But, but to, a, to, a, to a contemporary audience, they would recognize that this was an important feature of the, of the painting. This picture here is by Thomas Leclerc, and talk about rare, there really only are three or four paintings by this man known that are not portraits, real portraits. Uh, that is to say, head and shoulders busts of people. Nobody cares anything about those. What they care about is his genre paintings. And here, of course, we have a black man, and this picture is called Young America. And so this boy here is obviously telling us something of interest. He's maybe making a political point. He could be making a local point, uh, either about himself or his friends. Who knows? 
The implication is, is that he's saying something important because, of course, he's up on this soapbox here. These boys are not particularly interested. They're playing mummy peg or whatever they're doing. The handbills on the, on the back wall turn out to be kind of like a signature. This picture came up in an auction at Dumachelles in Detroit about five years ago. And a, a group of us dealers saw the picture. It was a tri not attributed. The picture was uh, listed as an American school painting, 19th century. And so we're all looking at this picture. We say, that's a very good picture. I wonder who painted it. And so we're, we're kind of going through the literature and thinking about it. Many of us knew who painted it at, uh, on the day that it was sold. It was estimated, I think, at eight to ten thousand dollars or something like that. A friend of mine and I were going to we were going to bid some extraordinary amount of money for it. I won't even tell you how much. Um, and we never got our finger in the air. It brought four and a half million dollars, which for an unknown painting, you know, by an unknown pa painter, uh, is pretty extraordinary. Uh, it turns there's something else which is interesting about it, which I noticed. I don't think anybody else has noticed this yet. If you look at the hands uh, on all of the figures, especially this one right here, you might notice that they're about 15% too small. All of the figures have this curious attribute that all of them have these little itty tiny hands. Look at this one here. This hand is maybe half too small for this <laughs> figure. So this is not something the painter is doing on purpose. It's just something that he kind of can't help. And so for me, it's a signature. And so I went and looked at the other pictures by Thomas Leclerc that I was able to identify, and they too have this curious element. So I felt very certain that the picture was by Thomas Leclerc, and by now we know that it, it is. This picture is by William Sidney Mount. We've seen him before of the schoolboys quarreling. By the way, that picture from 1830 was one of the first genre pictures that he ever did. He was a very young man in, in those days. He was born in 1807, so he was only 23. Um, this picture is in the height of his career. This picture belongs to the Cleveland Art Museum. It did belong for many years, like maybe 100 years, to the Century Club in New York City. And the Century Club had, the, had two pressing problems. Number one, they were in a Sanford White, beautiful Sanford White building, and the roof was falling in. And the engineer told them they had to replace the roof, and it was going to cost four or five million dollars. And they, oh, oh my God, it's horrible. The Century Club only admitted men, and they had a woman at the, at the, right outside the door at that moment who was a Harvard-educated lawyer. That was a mistake letting them into Harvard. And she wanted to bust the Century Club for, 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 for not admitting women. And she had a pretty good plan. And so the Century Club was under attack. They had the roof falling in. They had this woman pressing them to admit women. And they needed money. They sold the picture. So I sold this picture to the Cleveland Art Museum. I got a really good price for it. Anyway, the reason we're talking about it here is because obviously this black man, who is not a part of the action in the sense these men back here are playing a fiddle or playing a tune, but this man's in the foreground. And he is, uh, William City Mount distinguished himself in American genre painting by not only including black men, he didn't caricaturize them. He, he didn't, th this man is, is full of dignity, even though he has patches on his jeans and, he, and he's, uh, carrying a, he's carrying a, a, what looks like a top hat, it's obviously frayed, but he's listening to music. And so we, we, we don't think of him, he's not a, he, he's, William Sidney Mount is not making fun of this, pic, of this man. He's, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, building this man up. He's letting us say, th this man is, is keen on music, and the, that's the uh, title of the picture, The Power of Music. Uh, down here is a jug, this is a, this is a, a symbol of, of uh, 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 alcohol. Uh, clearly, this is not the you know, water jug. This is this is uh, what almost all farmers did with about a third of their of their grain crop. They made alcohol, and this implement here is a, probably a symbol for Abraham Lincoln, who, as you all know, was called the, the rail splitter. And so, uh, Mount is giving us plenty of of things to think about in this picture. Um, this picture, which is uh, perhaps if the Metropolitan Museum were on fire and I had only one picture to take out, it might very well be this picture. It's by Winslow Homer and it's called Dressing for the Carnival, 1877. It's after the Civil War now. It's 10 years or more after the Civil War. And what we have here, of course, as you can all see, is a picture which is entirely about black people. 
and, and you, you can't really see what the action here is. It's dressing for the carnival. We, we, we're, we're about to go to the carnival. This lady here is holding a needle, and you can't see it, but there's a tiny little thread, and she's either sewing on a button onto this man's harlequin outfit. And so she's just, Homer has just caught her doing that. Click. And so we have a sort of a, we, we've, we've got that snapshot thing here going again, but, but look at the beautiful colors here that he's put in. And this little contrapposto pose that this figure has here. To say nothing of that pose, that gorgeous hand that she's holding up there like that. I don't know quite what's going on here. This lady's smoking a cigarette. These are obviously children, doing what children do. And this little child over here is kind of just weighing down the picture on that, on that side. But the, the, uh, this, this, um, this kind of grouping of figures, if you like, we call this a mise en page. It, it means the place on the page. He's, he, he could have taken all these figures and just put them right in the middle of the picture. Not, not so interesting. He put them over here. He's a count cantilevered them. We don't, we don't necessarily see this. It just plays in our subconscious that gives the power a little bit of off balance. It gives us a feeling that we, that we need to pay attention because something is happening. And obviously what's happening is Wilbur Homer's painting a picture of, of eight or 10, whatever it is, uh, black people. Uh, now we're going to shift to another genre, which is called Western genre. Uh, we don't actually call it Western genre, we just call it Western pictures. Uh, but they are a part of genre. And they, um, uh, uh, Western genre almost always means that it shows uh, Indians. Um, now, Western genre comes in two varieties, and there are, they break as follows. Early Western genre, which is to say 1820 to about um, uh, 1860 or 1870, are almost always documentarian in their in their uh, in their point of view. In other words, the painter is showing us Indians as they dressed, uh, showing us what they did, uh, showing us where how they lived, and uh, and giving them uh, giving us an idea of that. So this picture is by John McStanley. It's called Gambling for the Buck. Uh, uh, I guess that's what they're doing. Um, it has a slightly uh, Hollywoody sound to it that I don't like, but it's painted eight, in 1867. So it's of the documentarian type. The second type after the Civil War is a sort of a Cecil D. De, B. DeMille kind of thing where we had Frederick Reming and so we're gonna to get to some of these, but they are cinematic or they are sentimental, or they are uh, 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 over the top. Um, they're, they're, they're not documentarian. So uh, in this picture, we have obviously three Indians who are, uh, who are dressed as if they were uh, going to a ceremony. Who knows if this is the way they dressed when they were playing uh, cards, which is what they're playing here. And here is a, here is a buck down here that, that has, has been killed. The dog is taking an interest. I, I, I can't help thinking that's not what they're doing. I, th I think somebody came along and made up that title. And I, uh, we won't get into that, but titles do get made up. Um, and then up here in the ceiling again are little bits of still life, which, uh, which uh, John McStanley could have put in just to hold the picture together. Um, we, have a, we do have a, a sort of a pyramidal uh, kind of construction to the picture. Not terribly obvious. But the, and this is a good sized picture, maybe 45 inches high. Um, uh, and um, uh, he, he too is, is uh, fairly rare. This one is by Seth Eastman. Uh, Chippewa Indians playing checkers. That's clearly what they're doing, 1848. Um, and uh, th this picture, uh, uh, Seth Eastman was an army officer. And in the army in those days, if you went to West Point, one of the things you had to do was to learn to draw because all army officers had to be able to, to, to make a quick sketch of the battlefield or other things of interest. We, uh, they didn't have any uh, cameras, even though photography had been invented, the army didn't have them, and they had their artists. Why, why do we need these? You know, and, and photography was very cumbersome in those days. So army officers learned to draw. Seth Eastman learned to paint. He was actually a very good painter. This is one of his, his really fine, fine paintings. 
We have back here a little scene. I think this is a woman and a child. And so, and, and here we have uh, uh, a, a hut, uh, a Chippewa hut, obviously. And this, this fellow here just lounging around happens to be wearing a bear claw necklace. Hmm, maybe. Uh, and here we, ha we have a rifle. And so clearly, these are not Indians in the uh, these are not Indians in the wild. Wild. These Indians have been have been uh, introduced, shall we say, to their white brethren. And so they have they have checkers, uh, which I don't think they had on their own. I could be wrong about that. Here they have a, a, a pipe for smoking tobacco. This is probably a keg for rum or or, or some other kind of uh, uh, alcohol. And, uh, and once again, the, the, the rifle leaning against the, uh, whatever it's leaning against there. Uh, this picture, we're back to Charles Day's. You might think I'm in this gaming thing here. I kind of am. Uh, this picture has another lovely story. Shall I tell you the, the lovely story? Yes. Uh, th this is called Winnebago's playing checkers. So uh, a friend of mine who's a dealer in, on Madison Avenue, uh, and I, in, in those days I used to, you know, of an afternoon I might just kind of go for a stroll, nothing to do, and so I would kind of just go stroll and see what my friends were doing, and I dropped in on this particular dealer, and we exchanged, I don't know, gossip and so forth and so on, and I got up to go, and he said, oh, he says, I have something I want to show you. And he handed me a transparency, that, which means a color uh, slide, uh, which is what dealers used to use to, to, to represent pictures. And so he hold, I hold it up to the light, and he says, do you have any idea who painted this? Well, as it happens, I did. Uh, and, and it's by Charles Days, our old friend, the one who painted uh, Walking the Chalk. And I did know who painted this picture. But once again, there are only about 23 of his pictures that are extant, and so he didn't know. And he had told me he had sent it to all of the experts on, on Seth Eastman, on George Caleb Bingham, on John McStanley, on, uh, on Catlin. He, he kept sending it to all these scholars, hoping one of them would say, oh, I recognize that picture. That's, my, that's by my boy, whoever he was. Uh, uh, and he, couldn't, he wasn't getting anywhere. And so he was somewhat out of ideas, and so he showed it to me. And I said, well, I know right what it is. And he said, well, I, I said, what's the deal? And he said, well, you know who it's by, who is it by? And I said, what's the deal? And he said, well, if you know who it's by, then we'll buy it 50-50. He said, I can buy it for $50,000. And I said, I'm in. We don't need contracts, at least we didn't in those days. And so that made us, now we're partners. And so I told him it was by uh, Charles Days. And he said, we'll go right away and see it. Well, right away and see it was in California. Then we got on a plane and out we went to California. We drove into this, I remember it, into a, a, a how should we call it, a housing development. Uh, a, a housing development, you know, with, with a kind of grid streets and things like that. We came up to this man's house and he very proudly came out with the picture and he showed it to us. And it, there was no signature on the front or on the back. And I nodded to my friend that I was sure. And so he said, well, we, you know, it's a risk, but we'll take it, you know. And so we took it, and out we went, and, and I was very pleased with myself. And we sent it right away to the restorer because it had been relined. That is to say, the canvas was <clears throat> old and frail, and what, what, uh, what we do in, the, in that case is we glue another canvas to the back uh, th that gives the original canvas some more structure. But we didn't like the way it had been uh, relined, and so we were going to remove the relining and see what really was going on. And the restorer calls up, and he, lo and behold, he says, the picture is fully signed and dated on the back. Charles Day's St. Louis, 1837, Winnebago's playing checkers, you know, <laughs> like that, you know. And so we sold it to a man named Baron Heine Thiessen, who lives in Lugano. And I don't know why he bought it, because Swiss people don't ordinarily buy American pictures. But anyway, getting back to the picture itself, once again, we have, we have three, uh, two uh, Indians playing checkers, or drafts, as it's called. And this one's wearing a roach, uh, and uh, obviously a, what looks like a silver uh, armband on his arm here. And then in the background, you, I'm sorry you can't see better details, but there are all these uh, little bits of still life back here, not to mention the still life that we have in the foreground, kind of scattered around. And so this picture, which is only about this big, is just, just 
to me, it just sends shivers up my spine. I love the picture uh, because, uh, first of all, I made a lot of money on it, and second of all, it's just a beautifully painted picture by this, uh, by Charles Days. This picture is also by Charles Days. It's called The Death Struggle. By now, you're thinking they're everywhere. But this one is actually hanging in the Shelburne Museum up in Shelburne, Vermont. You can see it. And it's one of Days' biggest pictures. It's sort of, uh, I don't know what, uh, 60 inches perhaps uh, by uh, 30 or so. And, what, and we can see uh, here uh, that, that this man here is, is funny. These two characters, the Indian on his horse and the white man on his horse, are going over a rather huge precipice. He's making this little stab with his hand for that little branch. He's going, you know, oh, I think I'll grab the branch on my way over. <laughs> and the, the, the Indian is holding on to him because he's grabbing the branch. The horses are going to take care of themselves. And this Indian is going, oh, my. You know, that looks pretty good. And so uh, the, um, you remember when I was talking to you about the little hands, which were the signatures uh, uh, of Thomas LeClaire. Uh, Charles Day's signature are these rather ping pong ball uh, eyes that he puts into the into uh, in all his figures that, and the horses especially the horses always look like somebody has just set off a firecracker right next to them and they are just whoa what is that and he always paints that way and so that, uh, not that there was any doubt about this picture because it's been at the Shelburne Museum for a hundred years and I'm pretty sure it's uh, it's probably uh, uh, signed on the front. But um, another signature of Charles Day's is this vermilion uh, shirt that this man is wearing. And, and uh, he, uh, Charles Day's liked to use that color. You might remember from the Winnebago's playing checkers, uh, he uses that red. Uh, uh, trust me, it's the same. This, this is a little uh, muddied and this here. Uh, he loves to use that right out of the tube as it were, and most painters will soften that red a little bit because it's, it's kind of in your face, but Days used it straight. Uh, so uh, now a shift to yet another little minor uh, uh, part of genre, which is uh, called Orientalism. And, and Orientalism had to do with uh, the Orient. And in those days, the Orient meant anything east of Greece. Um, and so, uh, it, uh, and, and if, if any of you have ever read, and for those of you who haven't, I highly recommend Mark Twain's book called The Innocents Abroad. It is one of the funniest things you will ever read in your life. And he was paid by the St. Louis Dispatch to get on a boat and go to the Orient and write a story for the St. Louis Dispatch on, on what he saw there. And, he, and, and in those days, you, would, you started at Gibraltar, and you got off, and then you went to Rome, or, and you got off the boat, and then you went to Naples, and then you went to Athens, and, and, and all the way around uh, to, to Tangiers, and so forth and so on, and, and a year later, you would go back home. And uh, th this picture here is actually by Charles Sprague Pierce. Mark Twain didn't paint, that I know of. Um, and uh, uh, this picture is called the Arab Jeweler. All of the genre pictures, and the, the school began in, in France, really, in the 1840s. Uh, and uh, it accompanied, and everybody was running off to the Orient to see this fabulous, to, to go to see Egypt, to see the pyramids, to see the, the, the camels, and, and all of this wonderful thing uh, uh, that was going on down there. And a, a whole lot of painters went too. Most of the Americans went in the 1860s, late 1860s. Gifford went. Uh, most of them painted in the 1880s. So this is, would be one from the 1880s. Uh, this one is by uh, this one is by Frederick Bridgman. It's called the Diversion of an Assyrian King, um, from 1877. And we have to just move along a little bit. This one is by William Sidney Mount, called Bargaining or the Painter's Try. I'm sorry, it's not called that at all. This is called Bargaining for a Horse. And uh, w w these two men are obviously, this guy is whittling, and this one is doing, I'm not entirely sure what, but they're talking about money. They're talking about buying this or selling this horse. And one gets the feeling that this man is doing the buying because he's going out of his way to, to seem uh, uninterested in the proceeding. And so maybe they're going to spend an hour doing this. And the interesting thing about this is, is that the horse is shown rear end two, which is not the way, is not the horse's best <laughs> aspect. And so we, we, we think that the horse is obviously important to the composition, but obviously not important to the action. Uh, in this picture here, this is the painter's triumph, also by William Sidney Mount. 
and they are looking at a picture, the painter obviously holding the palette here, and this man has just come by, he's a friend, but he's holding a whip, so he's just come in, and maybe he's a, maybe he's a buyer, because the painter is, is exclaiming about what, look at what I, look at my picture, and we don't even get to see the picture, because the picture's facing away, because that's not the point, we're not supposed, we're supposed to look at these two, and you, we can tell by the gesture that this man is, that he is throwing himself into this, into his sales pitch. So we have, coming on here, we have another something which is beginning to happen toward the end of the 19th century in American pictures, and that is humor. Um, and it, it's pretty low humor. Um, the, the joke is supposed to be pretty obvious, and it's supposed to a appeal to everybody. So we're not talking about references to Shakespeare here. Uh, we're just talking about something as, 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 as uh, uh, quotidian, if you like, uh, of this painter trying to sell his, his ware. Um, and uh, this picture is by uh, uh, Francis Edmonds called The New Bonnet. And once again, we have something humorous here because this man here, his father, has just got the bill. And he can't believe it. Look at the, look at the expression on it. And she's saying, oh, but it's the most fantastic thing ever. And so the appeal here is no longer the painter's skill. And Francis Edmonds wasn't a bad painter, but he realizes that if he wants to sell this picture, he's going to have to put this element of low humor into it. Uh, this picture it does not have low humor. This is by Charles Cochran Lambden, and it's called The Consecration. And we have here another, but, but a very rare uh, thing going on, and th uh, that is a sexual innuendo. Uh, this woman is kissing his weapon. And uh, in American painting, if you, if you put sexual innuendo into a picture, you had better lay it between the lines pretty carefully because it's not something that Americans respond with great alacrity to. And yet I don't see that there's any other way to, to, uh, to interpret that picture. Um, uh, now we're back to Winslow Homer. This is the veteran in the, in the new field. And this he painted at the end of the, of the uh, Civil War in 1865. And what we're supposed to see here down here is a little, here's the, 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 um, the uniform and his canteen, you can't see it and his sword are, are lying down here. And so this man is a veteran, and, but he's, he's working. He's now come home, and he's harvesting wheat. But he's in a new field. And uh, obviously, the field has yet to be cut, but that's not what we're talking about. Homer is talking about a new era. And so Homer is a little more subtle in his messages. He's, he's above uh, low humor uh, almost entirely. Uh, and so th the message that Homer uh, uh, conveys it ha has a tendency to be uh, profound. This one here by Homer also is called the Croquet Match. It's in the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and this picture is um, uh, elegant, terribly elegant. Th th these ladies are beautifully dressed. Keep in mind that in America in 1866, we didn't really have an upper class that we would have admitted to. But these people here are really not middle class. And so we have here uh, what, what, the, what the elegant do on an afternoon. The gentleman who is in the center of the picture, remember our old uh, thing here with we cross, the gentleman's in the middle of the picture, but he has his head down. And so he clearly is not, we're not doing a portrait of him. And we are not really doing, these are generic women. Uh, people have written essays about Homer's uh, 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 his uh, relationship with women. He was unmarried. He lived a very long life. Uh, no one even remembers that he ever had a relationship with a woman. And so his, his, his females always seem to be formulaic. Um, but croquet was an, a recent import from France. And so we have here upper class people doing uh, an upper class game. And uh, that's Homer's message uh, there. Here is one of Homer's most famous pictures. I'm, I'm giving you Homer because no lecture on American genre painting would possibly be complete without Homer because Homer's paintings are genre pretty much from beginning to end. And it, beginning is 1835 and end is 1910. So he spent his entire career painting pictures of people doing what people do. 
And this picture, which is an absolutely marvelous, marvelous picture, is called Breezing Up, and it's in the National Gallery of Art. And um, we have some little fish down here in the bottom of the cat boat, but that's not what we are doing out here. The, the, the old man, who is obviously a sailor, but he's like a Gloucester uh, fisherman. He's wearing a, a, a fisherman's hat, and he's taking the boys out for, for, a, for a bit of a, a spin. And uh, uh, this picture also makes me weak in the knees. Uh, uh, this picture is by Thomas Anschutz, called Farmer and His Son. It's a, it's a, uh, Thomas Anschutz uh, was a contemporary of Aikens from Philadelphia. He actually taught Aikens. This is a marvelous picture for a number of reasons. Number one, you see the boy, is, he's drinking from a bucket. And he's got his face in the bucket, so the picture is obviously not about him. Uh, the farmer is wetting his side. What I like about the picture is all of the colors in the picture are from the cool end of the palette. The sky is blue, and the, and the trees are green. I think the closest thing we really have to the warm side of the palette are these this little tiny uh, row of slightly reddish flowers. But the whole picture is cool. And for some strange reason, that is attractive to me. Don't know. Uh, this one's by Thomas uh, Anschutz as well. It's called Iron Workers Noontime from 1860. It's in the uh, San Francisco Palace of the Legion of Honor. And uh, these, we have here now, um, uh, this is obviously a steel plant or an iron plant. Uh, it used to be called Steel Workers Noontime. And these men are obviously at their noon hour. This one is washing up. This one is pumping water. They're all washing. It's a hot day. Uh, but this man here is posing in this curious way. And we have here an indication of the presence of photography. We now know photography is a real thing. And, and photographs, of course, still capture people in, in these curious poses. And so this picture is by Thomas Aikens. And it's called The Pathetic Song, 1881. And uh, she, too, is captured uh, as if in a photographic pose. And Aikens was himself a photographer, a very good photographer, actually, and he regarded it as a separate medium. And I need to say that to you because um, today, I'm sure all of you know, some, photo some painters will take pictures, hundreds of pictures, maybe hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and then they will choose from those, and then they will paint their picture after the photograph. Aikens didn't do that. He regarded photographs as a separate medium. He was also an expert draftsman. He was also an, uh, an outstanding painter. M some people say he is America's greatest painter, uh, not just greatest genre painter. He did portraits as well. This is a portrait of Weta Cook, we have no doubt. This uh, picture here is a, is a, a picture of the artist's um, uh, brother-in-law, and this is his sister. Uh, and yet, if you notice, the, the sister is sort of a, what we would say a fuzzed out. She's not just in the background, uh, in fact, she's also in the dark a little bit, and he's painted her a little bit fuzzed out. And that is a result of the, f of the camera has a depth of field. Uh, do you all know uh, in the days when you actually controlled those things on your camera? You had to set your, f you had to focus, and it, depending upon the light you had, things that were in the foreground would put things in the background out of focus. So Aikens is actually doing that. He has, he has Weta Cook in sharp focus and her song, her song sheet, and then the, the, the people in the background as well as the picture up there and the piano itself and so on are uh, in, the, in the fuzzy background. Uh, this is a picture by, uh, um, by uh, George, uh, John George Brown, rather, hiding in the oak. I only put it in here because uh, there's a sentimental, very, very definite sentimental feeling about this. J.G. Brown was nothing if not sentimental, uh, and he, he was also not a bad painter, but he completely succumbed to the, the need to make his pictures sentimental. This, is a, this one here is a late J.G. Brown, and he started painting these pictures of shoeshine boys and little street urchins, and he painted hundreds of them, way too many. And <laughs> this picture here is by Charles Schreibogel, and it's called My Bunky. Um, and it, it, the, the action here is this, this uh, cavalryman here has had his horse shot out from underneath him, and this, his bunk mate is picking him up uh, at a full gallop. Uh, even as the Indians who are not in the picture, they're over there someplace, they are, they, they're being attacked. You remember earlier when I was talking about uh, Western genre, there was the documentary type, and there was the Cecil B. DeMille type, 
This is the Cecil B. DeMille type. It doesn't make it necessarily a bad picture. And by the way, it's worth way more than the documentary because, because uh, men who like, the, and they're almost all men who like these pictures have a tendency to be Western uh, buyers. They're oil men or railroad men or timber men or something like that. They like manly pictures with action in them. And so this would be exactly what they like. And that's where I'll conclude. And I'm sorry I've run over a little bit, but that's where I'll conclude. And now I hope some of you have a question or so. Yes, sir. Uh, the man asks, what was the influence of Bruegel on these people? Um, I would have to say near zero. Uh, when, you, when, when you consider uh, uh, there were no Bruegels in the United States in those days, and the closest thing you could find to a Bruegel I don't think there were any prints. After, it would have to have been a photographic print. And so most of the painters we were looking at here were pre-photographs. And, they, were, uh, and they, they have a tendency to be very plain people with minimal education. Uh, uh, they would have shown a, 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 um, uh, an aptitude for painting. And the teacher would have said, you know, you should paint more, Johnny. Uh, and th so they might go to the Pennsylvania Academy, where they were, where they were uh, uh, encouraged to do what was called painting after the antique. They would be plunked down in front of a, of a plaster cast. And they did that because they wanted them to learn how to paint the body. A and to paint it not, that, not just this way, but also maybe this way. You know, so they had to do foreshortening and musculature and, and, and Bruegel. I think nothing. I'm going to live there a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to go with nothing. Yeah. Some of the, uh, she asks how the painters uh, supported themselves. Most of the 18th century painters that I showed you, Copley, uh, uh, Benjamin West, uh, we didn't do any Benjamin West, uh, uh, but the early 18th century uh, painters were pretty well paid. Copley was real well paid. And Benjamin West, who was, uh, who was a, a, born in Philadelphia, uh, by the way, when the, when the Revolutionary War broke out, this, and this was a problem, the, the country divided pretty much along class lines because the people who, the upper class people who could afford to have their picture done and, and, and pay the painter something were pretty much with the king. Uh, you know, that's where the bread was buttered, and the king had just given them this huge piece of land, and so on and so forth. So, m many of them went to England. Copley went to England. West went to England. Uh, Benjamin West became court painter to, to George III. Not bad for an American boy. Um, and so, they made their money from the upper class. Now, the genre painters that we looked at, starting in, with William Sidney Mount in 1830, and for, uh, they sold their pictures at, at, at exhibitions. They, they, there, was also, there was also a subscription. There was a thing called the American Art Union, which was very successful. The American Art Union was actually a printing press. And so uh, they, would, they would have an exhibition, and they would give an award to, to whoever won the first prize and the second prize. The first prize would have his painting reproduced on a, on a stone, on a lithographic stone. And they would sell these by the thousands. And so if, if, if you got your picture reproduced by the American Art Union and then people bought them for 50 cents a piece or 25 cents a piece, whatever, the money would come pouring in, so to speak. And this is the same, uh, this is the same as selling, um, uh, let's see, um, uh, I can't, why can't I think, I can't think what, uh, <coughs> There's this thing where you, where you, you sell a product like a, um, well, you sell the product and then you sell the comestible that, 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 that comes along with it. You know, I can't think of one right now. Licensing? What? The licensing? Yes, yeah, or, or like a camera for heaven's sake. You, you practically give the camera away, but it's, it's the film where you make the money. You're thinking about a printer. That's right. So the, you, you paint the picture. And you sell the painting for a few hundred dollars, whatever it is, but the money comes pouring in from Now, some painters like Albert Bierstadt and Frederick Church, and we didn't go into them because they didn't do 
They didn't do uh, a genre painting, they did landscapes. They would have an exhibition, and they did these huge paintings, by the way, not, uh, as big as that one, as big as that. And people, and then they would set it up in Philadelphia, or set up in Washington, or New York, or Boston, and they would charge admission. To literally, just to charge 25 cents to people to come in and look. And so they were painting the, the, the Andes, or they were painting the Rocky Mountains, or they're painting Niagara Falls. These were things that people wouldn't, they weren't gonna see them. You know, you, you were a shoemaker living in Boston or something like that. You were not gonna get much farther west than, you know, yeah, Springfield. And so, so the idea that, that, that somebody would actually go out and paint the Rocky Mountains, this was as close as you were gonna get, so you're gonna pay your 25 cents. And this actually made money for them. Uh, but many of these painters uh, uh, didn't make so much money, which is, I guess, why uh, why J.G. Uh, uh, Brown had to rely, rely uh, ultimately on these on these uh, cheap uh, sentimental pictures because those sold. They had no access. No, no. They they might have a plaster cast of of something uh, Greek or Roman but they were generic. They wouldn't have known anything about Michelangelo. And why, are you making a comment about? It seems that we were seen so far behind this. Yeah, it, it's worse than you think. <laughs> I, I, I love American painting, and it's the field I chose, so uh, from a certain point of view, I'm stuck with it. But, um, and I chose it when I was very young. Uh, but I, can, I went to the Prado last year in Madrid, and you, I leave there crying. I mean, the, the pictures that they have at the Prado make American pictures look like playthings, all of them. I mean, and they have floor after floor. Now, mind you, they had a 500-year start on us. <laughs> and, the, and so, I mean, they have a floor full of paintings done in 900, 1100. 1200, another, you know, they have another floor for pictures done in the 1300. You know, and, and America hasn't even been discovered yet. And, 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 and you go along, and I can go at a pretty good clip through museums, really, you know, looking and kind of, kind of, not there. Every picture, every picture, you have to look at it. And they have six, seven floors of them. And then you come home. <laughs> I love American pictures. Yes. <laughs> I love them, but but uh, holding a candle, don't hold the candle. So if you want to look at real pictures, go over there. <laughs> oh, she asked if I have these pictures in my home. Um, these these pictures that I'm showing you, not that one there, but but um, some pictures like that. Like that. That that picture there would be worth today forty million dollars. <coughs> uh, that picture would be worth twelve or fifteen million dollars. This picture would be a hundred million dollars. Hundred million dollars. Uh, Seventy-five million. Three. I don't have any. <laughs> uh, I did sell some of those pictures, though. Remember, I, t I mean, I told you, uh, and um, if you want to know. You know, you, you hear about income disparity. <laughs> so when I joined Park Burnett, we, uh, Sotheby's had just bought Park Burnett. So Sotheby's is an English auction house in London. And in 1964, they got into the head to, to, to come to America. And there are two ways they could establish a presence here. One is to set up as Sotheby's, and the other one was to buy an auction house that was already there. And so they bought Park Burnett, which was a struggling little very poorly run American auction house in New York, so Sotheby's bought it. And I joined the firm four years later, which is to say when they, they were just getting their feet underneath them. And American art went below the waves in about 1888. It's, uh, almost all, you, we all think that art, it does nothing but go up and up and up. Not true. Sometimes it goes down and down and down. American art, all of it, went below the waves in 1880 or so, and nobody cared a thing about it, with the exception of a few crazy scholars. It 
came out again, out of the basement in about 1965, just about the time that I graduated from college. And by the way, to tell you how bad it was in college, I went to Columbia. We, they, Columbia didn't offer one course in American art, not one. They had the most, they, they had one, they had one course, uh, Art of the Upper Sepik River, wherever that is. And not, they, couldn't, they couldn't bother with Winslow Homer or Thomas Aikens or any of these people here. And so when I joined Sotheby's, American art kind of didn't exist as a thing. And I walked into the painting department one day, and there were only eight of us in the painting department, maybe nine, I, I can't remember. And I noticed that no one wanted to do these American pictures that were kind of gathering up like wax on the kitchen floor, you know. Every once in a while you have to do something about it. And so I said I would do them. And there was, everybody stood up and I got a little hand. <laughs> and so I began. And I literally began at square one. And it just happened that, that the rest of the field was coming up like little shoots, of little green shoots. And so, and we sold, I mean, no American painting that year brought 100,000. And we had some pretty good ones. And the next year they brought 200,000. And the following year or so they brought 400,000. And on and on. And so that picture of the, uh, the, uh, the William Sidney Mount of pow the power of music with the black man standing outside, um, I sold that in 1993 for four and a half million dollars. Seems like a lot. Today it would be worth $65 million. I couldn't afford it then. I couldn't afford it then. I mean, so I, I felt very, very grateful to, to, you know, to just have the opportunity to pass it from one hand to the other. But the value of, of and I'm sure you've all read in the paper that, that paintings in New York are, are routinely bringing 25 million, 50 million, routine, every week. And every once in a while, one will bring 75, routine, or 100 million, not so routine at 100 now. 150 is the top that everybody can kind of, 150 million dollars. I find it really appalling, <laughs> frankly. Not no, no, not America. No, no, no. Um, uh, uh, we just did get, however, uh, I mean, we. Uh, Norman Rockwell brought just $43 million. And that's the most expensive American painting right now, Norman Rockwell. Is it Hirsch? Who? H-I-R-S-K. Hirsch. H-I-R. Damien Hirst. Oh, Damien Hirst. Yes, Damien Hirst, of course. Sorry, I was thinking of an American painter. Uh, Damien Hirst, very, very expensive. Yeah, oh, he's... <laughs> Shark, it's just formaldehyde if you want one. <laughs> what really determines the value? Okay, how long do you have? All right, so... <laughs> that is, that's a, a really interesting uh, question. So, um, uh, it goes like this. Um, the name of the painter is, well, actually, the most important thing is the macro economy. Everything is subject to the macro economy. So that, once we have that settled, the next thing is the name of the painter. The next thing is the subject. Now, you remember I said that, um, uh, that Richard, uh, or Thomas Leclerc painted genre paintings and also painted portraits? Nobody cares anything about the court. Nothing. George Caleb Bingham also, he's the one that came, uh, painted the county election. Remember with all the people outside talking? He also did portraits. He also did pure landscapes. No interest. Only the pictures, the genre pictures with the people in them. And, and the difference between, I mean, the portrait you can have for $1,000 or $2,000, and the, 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 uh, the genre paintings. 20, 30, 40 million. There aren't any. So, so, so that's the next thing. Next thing is size. Big is better to a point. You get a picture that big, kind of a problem. Uh, the medium, I should have put the medium in there, obviously, and for some reasons. Oil is more important, mostly more, more valuable than watercolor, more valuable than drawing, is more valuable than prints. Something like lithographs. 
So the medium, I should have said that long ago. But the size, then there's the condition. Some pictures are not in good condition. Although, I, I don't know whether any of you saw, uh, a group of dealers recently bought, uh, a, 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 bought a, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Any of you see this in the news? It just came out. It happened several months ago, but it just made the news. A, uh, a, a portrait of Jesus called Salvador Mundi, just epic, in pretty terrible condition, terrible condition. It had been painted over and painted over and painted over and repair damage and paint over some more. You could almost not see what was in it. It was sold in a country auction in England someplace for $1,500. And a group of dealers kind of found it, decided what it was, cleaned the stuff off it, uh, got a kind of a, uh, did some other research on it, figured out that it was by Leonardo, sold it for $75 million. <laughs> Pretty good market. Uh, so the subject is good. Jesus, uh, size not not big enough. I mean, you know, you like you like it a little bigger. Uh, and so little is bad sometimes, but too big is bad sometimes. The condition of this picture was what is is what was what was very very important. So those are essential. Those are essential. And and when I think that that I like pictures and that I think that I can look at a picture and analyze it for you, break it down as I have now. I've learned what makes each one of these painters valuable. And I have to learn that with each one of about 1,500 painters. That, because you need to know that when this guy paints, well, I'll give you an example, too. Fitz, Hugh Lane, Fitz Henry Lane, maybe some of you have heard of him, he paints uh, ocean, he paints boats. Silks, and they're very, very valuable. Unless the boat is in a storm, that's very bad. <laughs> very bad. <laughs> Another thing is that with a Western painting, like we have that that, that one there. If the uh, if the uh, horse has got his butt to you, very bad. <laughs> you don't want to make that mistake, <laughs> and you only make it once. <laughs> And then you find that out because you've got this picture of your parents. Well, uh, he, uh, he's asking about the Winnebago's playing checkers, the, the picture that I went to California to buy uh, by Charles Days. I was 99% sure in that case. Now, uh, I should point out, so, so I, it, that never occurred to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know this is a good question. And, and, and I gotta tell you something, American paintings, we're, we're only 150 years old in, in, the, in painting, maybe 200 at a stretch. And so in American painting, something is either right or not. And but when I say right, it means if the picture, if, if somebody is saying to you, this is by Tom Sagan's, it either is by him or not. There's no shade of gray. Very, very rarely is there a shade of gray. In old master paintings, there's nothing but shades of gray because they're five or six or 700, 800 years and Spain, Holland, France, England, Netherlands, you know, on and on. And so you, you don't even know where the, you know, you're lucky to know when, what the date of the picture is, roughly. <laughs> then the question is, I mean, what if it's Italian and it's 18th century? Could be by hundreds of people. <laughs> and so the whole thing about being an old master dealer is much harder than what we do. Because an old master painter has, a dealer has to say, I'm buying this picture for a thousand bucks and I know who it's by now he has to prove it. Gotta to go to the library and find some documentation. In my case, it's either right or not. Right? Right. Well, we paid fifty thousand for that picture. And I was almost hundred percent sure that it was right. And therefore, I mean if I had peeled up the, the back canvas and it had said Joe Smith painted this picture, uh, it would have been less worth a whole lot less than 50. <laughs> I would have got burned on that. So that's a better way to, to, to look at it. If, if the documentation went completely against me, it's never happened to me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be an expert. One more. What's my uh, opinion about the Antiques Roadshow? Uh, do they bring treasures out of the market? Well, the Antique Roadshow is a show 
Uh, and I don't think that they, I, I'm, I've never been on the antique show, Red Roadshow, I don't think that they salt the, the, those things. I think they actually do appear. Um, and, and I've seen the show, and I think it's, I think it's entertaining. And, it, and you know, it, when I first worked at, at Sotheby's, um, I would come in to work in the morning and the phone would ring, it would be the doorman, and he would say, there's a man outside that's got a picture to show you. Okay? And so I would go down, literally, and there'd be a man parked his car on the, and he'd have his pictures propped up against the car <laughs> on the curb. And so I would look at them and I would say, and, and, and you'd try to be nice, uh, and you would look and go, uh-huh, well that's not for us. And then this one, this one's really interesting, but not, not for us, probably. And this one, oh, it's a shame that's that big hole in it. And so it's a bit of a, and try to be nice, and off you go. So we had this, the president one day had this brilliant thought. He said, you know, in the, there's a slow period after Christmas, January, February, March, for some, everybody's still recovering from Christmas. And there was a slow period. And so he said, why don't we invite the public to bring us stuff, and we'll call it an heirloom discovery day. And everybody went, oh, <laughs> uh, please. Because I mean, this, is a, this was just what the same thing we were doing before, except this, but now he's going to invite people. Are gonna, well, they were around the block. I mean, <laughs> down the block. Same thing we did every day, but for some reason or other, they came out of the woodwork. And, so, and we actually discovered some stuff. People actually brought stuff that, you know, they didn't know what it was, and we did, <laughs> kind of thing. And, it, and of course, in the auction business, you, you don't have a conflict of interest. This is important. It's not like a dealer. Dealers have, a, have a, their interest. And then there's the guy that sold me that picture, you know, that the Charles Daisy we're talking about. He said, I'm not 50000 for it. We bought it. I knew what it was. He didn't. So in, the, in the auction business, if he had brought his picture in, I would have said to him, Oh, I know what that is. It's worth a whole lot of money. And he would have said, really? And I would have said, yeah, trust me. And so I would have gone, I would have repaired it. I would have found out the signature for him, and put it up for auction, and he would have made all the money on that. So the auction house people, the auction people think of themselves as pretty, pretty special <laughs> because, you know, they're, they're, they're untainted by, by uh, venal interest. <laughs> oh, I worked at the uh, auction house a long time, and I got that out of my system. <laughs> uh, so now, I, now I, it's a different thing. I, I, it's not quite that bad. But, because um, I still do tell people what they have. But anyway, does that answer your question? Yes, the, the Antique Roadshow, it's pretty, I'm sure it's genuine. I think it's pretty entertaining. And I, I don't know what they do if they get something really good. I mean, it, they don't really get anything terribly good, do they? Somebody will come in with a silver ewer or something like that, and they say, you know, this is worth a thousand bucks. And the guy goes, my, great. <laughs> something like that. All right. Thank you very much.